Hello, everybody. Thanks for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here and to talk to you about the European IPF uh, registry. Um, these are my can we see the slides? There they are. These are my conflicts of interest. Uh, the European IPF registry is probably the oldest registry from those that we hear about today. It's 10 years old. You can see in blue the countries in Europe that are participating in this registry. Uh, it has been founded out of the European IPF network, which was uh, an EU uh, frame program seven funded translational research network where the European IPF registry was a, a smaller uh, part which uh, only had a limited funding, and I have to say right up front that uh, since the ending of the official funding through the EU, we have been kept alive by some support through foundations and industry. I would like to mention Roche and Beringer and also NITO who have been able, enabling us to survive uh, and to continue to recruit patients. Uh, I think this is a problem that many of us face. So the focus of our registry from the beginning on was not only to focus on IPF, but also other forms of ILD. Uh, we wanted to uh, collect longitudinal data, allowing us to characterize the natural cause, risk factors for uh, aggravation and for evolution of the disease, and to decipher treatment responses. And a very, very important point right from the beginning was to provide biomaterials for research, uh, for translation research, biomarker development, and development and, and scrutinization of novel treatment modalities. Um, data safety is an issue in Europe, as you know, so we had to work a little bit on, uh, on an allergen data safety uh, concept, which uh, is shown here, so you can see that the patient identifying information has to be kept simply uh, separated from uh, the medical data information. It's a, more or less a kind of a complex system uh, in, in, uh, which makes use of a pseudonymization process uh, but allows us to keep the patient identifying information also on track and to re-identify patients under certain conditions. Our uh, broad informed consent procedure is a multi-level informed consent procedure, so we are asking patients if they would like or if they would agree to have genetic uh, testing being done. They, we asked them if we would be able to share data and biomaterials with other research uh, uh, collaborations and also with pharma industry. We asked them for re-identification if they would fit to clinical trials or if they uh, would probably profit from some information we retrieved during the course of the work uh, using their sample. So it's a quite a multi-step level informed consent procedure has turned out to be quite effective and good. So we use the SICO trial uh, uh, software solution, which is a software that had been developed by the German Parkinson network. It's a, a more or less a kind of a shareware system, which allows us to keep the registry alive with low cost. Also, the data hostage is uh, co-sponsored by this. And as you can see, there are baseline and follow-up data sets that are going to be captured from each patient. And the over 3,000 parameters that we are going to collect are divided into several blocks, such as patient history, symptoms, uh, physical examination data, lung function, of course, gas exchange, exercise testing, HRCTs. The HRCT will be able to be uploaded into the system, and during this process, the header of the CT will be removed by the pseudonym of the patient. This can be done multiple times. We also, of course, collect data of bronchoscopy, uh, BAL biopsy, uh, right heart catheter, echocardiography, blood tests, uh, quality of life questionnaires, and biomaterials. We can also upload PDF scans from histology slices and do have the chance to do digital pathology, uh, meaning that we digitalize uh, pathology slides. Uh, as you can see up to now, this is a deadline April 1st. We had been able to include 833 patients with idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, of which 622 patients were IPF patients and more than 100 were unclassifiable. Uh, and as I have been telling you, we are also from the beginning on collecting other disease entities, including non-ILD diagnosed such as lung cancer, COPD, emphysema, as important disease controls uh, showing the same age range and to some extent the same nicotine uh, exposure. Uh, and we do also have data from uh, other forms of ILD other than IIP, and you can see that there are 330 patients already included in the registry. A lot of biomaterials, around 1,500 for blood-based samples. There are a lot more BAL data as shown here because they still have to be entered into the system. 
And I would like to briefly review our, our current achievements. As I said, this is a 10-year-old registry, so we do have some publications that are resulting from either the clinical or the biomaterial-based work, and I would just like to quickly uh, go through this. So we have some data on uh, electric gnosis uh, using uh, a, a prothomics approach to try to separate different forms of ILD, so we have been making the experience that IPF can be safely separated from controls. The sensitivity of the gnosis that we have been applying so far is not good enough to identify separate uh, sub-entities of ILDs, but we think there's a potential in the system. We have been describing families with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, have been evaluating uh, psychometric properties, I have been also assessing the utility of lipid mediators and exhaled breath markers or exhaled breath condensates. There's uh, also a study that had been published on lung CT densitometry and the baseline characteristics of our patients, as well as a, a paper on intra-individual responses to treatment with antifa products. I would just like to highlight some few of them. This is an earlier paper employing some patients from our registry where we could see that the response to perfenidone based on the intra-individual FEC slope can be remarkably different between different IPF patients. The majority of patients being in a progressive state, turning into a more stable state, but also patients that seem not to profit from this particular treatment and others who deteriorate under treatment, uh, whereas they had been stable before, only a minor fraction, but it pretty much reflected the average of what we are seeing in the clinical trials. Um, the baseline description or the baseline paper that had been published uh, last year uh, showed that uh, indeed, um, as compared to previously non-treated patients, and since our registry is 10 years old, we did have a, a number of patients not receiving antifibrotic treatment as compared to these patients. The introduction of the antifibrotic therapy had been on average duplication or had a duplication of the mean, uh, median survival as a consequence. Um, we did do some work in HRCT, as I had been mentioning, so this is an innovative approach looking at the lung densitogram, um, where we had been assessing hand-segmented CT sections and uh, uh, looked at the density of these sections um, by, uh, by conducting the first derivative, we could uh, identify the uh, area right of the inflection point, which, re which reflects the fibrotic scar tissue and found out by univariate and multivariate analysis that this is highly correlated with outcome, um, even better than some of the lung function tests we are using, and we're currently trying to assess that uh, in a, a more a novel approach using uh, um, volumetric scans of CTs. And then there's a long list, uh, close to 50, of articles that have been published employing and using materials, biomaterials from the European IPF registry and uh, Biobank uh, focusing on uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transaction, fibroblast subpopulations, conversion of myofibroblasts into lipofibroblasts and back, uh, impact of different signaling cascades, including notch TGF beta, some uh, um, uh, coagulant pathways, as you can see. And just to give you some uh, insight in what we're currently trying to establish and to do is that we are switching from more let's say, homogenate-based uh, analysis of lung tissues to living uh, lung tissues. This is uh, the technology of precision-cut lung slices that we are trying to implement on a large scale um, using the uh, lungs from transplanted patients participating in the registry. You can see that we can keep these tissues quite vital on the left, uh, lower right. You can see all green cells which are non-apoptotic and some few red cells being apoptotic. After generation of these PCLS, you can use them, take them in short-term culture, and study relevant pathways. For example, as an example, the notch pathway here, uh, shown here is the impact of a notch antagonism, um, which is called DAP versus DMSO, which is the, the control. You can see that color gene expression is, is strikingly going down in response to this treatment in different PCLS obtained from different patients with IPF undergoing transplantation. And at the same time, you can see that the, um, that the differentiation status of the type 2 cell indicated by a lysotracker standing on the upper left or a mature SPB standing on the lower right is greatly increased in response to an antagonism of notch signaling. So it's just as an illustration that we're aiming to mo make more use of these PCLS as a patient-centered approach to scrutinize and to assess uh, the, the efficacy of, of targets or the efficacy of drugs aiming to, 
to, to address specific targets in IPF lungs. Um, we are currently also working on trying to cryopreserve these PCLS on a large scale, which would allow us um, to decouple the analysis of pathways in these PCLS from the provision of the material, because right now we have to uh, work on the lung tissue that we receive at the moment we receive it, um, which is somewhat complicated, as you can imagine. Um, so it would allow us to, to decouple this process and to do analysis on PCLS at any time of our convenience. Um, finally, as a, as a kind of a outlook in the future, we are also working on trying to isolate uh, progenitor cell populations from IPF lungs that um, have been donated by patients participating in the register. Here you can see the difference in organoid formation of type 2 cell preparations. Upper panel is a donor lung uh, tissue that, that was uh, coming along with the uh, explanted lung, uh, which had been resected because of size incompatibilities. And in the lower you find the IPF lung specimen, uh, both are fax separated type 2 cells that have been put into an uh, organoid culture, and you can evidently see that there is a great difference with regard to the formation of organoids between the donor and the IPF lung. So let me spend some few uh, seconds on our future goals. Um, so our primary goal will be to enlarge and to expand the IPF registry um, to an ILD registry in Biobank. This has been done this autumn. Our intention will be to collect another 4,000 ILD patients in the next three years. Uh, we have been recruiting additional sites who are going to participate. We have been uh, f um, putting up a proposal which is currently under the final review uh, in the European Joint Program on Rare Diseases. So we are amongst the 45 proposals out of 280 who survived the first phase. <laughs> we do hope that we get uh, a final uh, uh, submission and a final uh, call to do our work. Um, as you can see on the right side, these are the new sites that have been next to the old ones that have been joining us to do this kind of endeavor. Uh, a lot of names that you are all familiar with, including also Simon Walsh, who is going to work on the HRCTs that we're going to collect in this consortium. On the left hand, you will see what we're intending to do. So it will be a combination of a deep phenome and a multi-level omics approach uh, with deep phenome. Um, I largely refer to what I've been telling you, including some handheld measurements, of course, based on Toby's initial experience. Uh, we will certainly look for spirometry, accelerometry, and saturation measurements and exercise tests. And on the field of the omics, we also still want to explore if exhaled breath condensates or prathomics data may be helpful to distinguish patients in this regard. We will include uh, the sniff phone, the so-called sniff phone from Hossam Haik, an Israeli uh, colleague who has been working on this technique for a longer time period. And at the end of the day, all, all data, the clinical data as well as the multi-level omics data will be put into a rare ILD data warehouse and, and, and will include some artificial intelligence-based analysis of all these uh, different data, allowing us probably to identify disease-specific signatures as well as to um, and define a kind of a progressive course which may probably prone patients to a certain treatment approach. Yeah, with this I think I'm done prior to the end of my time. I would like to thank in the middle section, you can see the, the contributors from the European IPF registry. So these were the founding uh, colleagues of our registry and um, I do thank them for their continuous effort and thanks uh, for your audience.